started a wolf conservation centre in upstate New York. Why wolves? I started with wolves only because of an encounter many years ago in northern Florida. I encountered a, a high content hybrid and that moment was really a defining moment. There was this, you know, this it was this pivot point. There was the before and the after. I became possessed with the idea that, you know, the species as a whole needed help. And that's what gave me the idea of an environmental education center. If you work to save large predators or wide-ranging predators, you, without oversimplifying, you save every animal which is living below that animal in the food chain. To be involved in direct conservation and being able to put animals back where they belong, there's just nothing more exciting. Just curious, complete side note, but do you think wolves have their own kind of music too? We were hearing a howl and it suddenly struck me that um, music might not be limited, you know, for human beings and I'd never thought that before. I would agree with that. I mean, first of all, I think wolves howling, it's, it's one of the most beautiful sounds of nature. Um, I mean, it's, of course, it, it has different functions. It's one of their strongest forms of communication. Uh, certainly the one that struck um, the most human's imagination. One of the functions of howling, which I've always uh, found so lovely, is this, um, this bonding element and the fact that it's almost like social glue. is through acquaintance um, that you can motivate people. I think if people are touched um, by meeting such an animal, yeah. that's when you can really motivate people to do something about it. <laughs> and just like it worked for me, that's also the idea behind the Wolf Conservation Center. You said that you get obsessed by pieces. You know, all of a sudden they sort of possess you and you want to know as much as possible about them. Um, how did that happen with this list piece that you played? Well, the list sonata, because it is such a war horse of the piano repertoire, mm -hmm. you know, as you get more and more uh, capable as a young pianist, you of course discover the list sonata. And you can't really call yourself a pianist if you don't actually play the piece. So it's a piece which I discovered fairly early on. And it's kind of this monumental quest, it feels like to me, this piece. Does it feel like that to you? How do you feel when you're playing it? It's a beautiful way to describe it. It is a monumental quest. It's of monumental proportions. I think it's the longest sonata in one movement um, ever written. So I've always felt that it has a sort of magnetic power, it gets under your skin. And the, the spectrum of emotions is tremendous. There's something quite uh, demonic and uh, some, you, know, you can feel as if other forces are at hand. You've been very ill recently. Has that changed the way you feel about pieces or do you feel differently about music now? I don't know if I feel differently about music, because music was already the center of my existence. I mean, it's actually all I've ever known, really. Um, but it's, it has certainly uh, given me an extra dose of urgency back. You, you have this punishing schedule now. Does it feel to you like a burden to go back to all of this, or does it feel...? No, it doesn't at all feel like a burden. It's true that when I, when I started playing again in the middle of August, and since I've started playing again, it's been probably the most intense schedule I have ever had. But you get a lot back doing this uh, from the public, from the colleagues, and this really keeps you, keeps you going. If this is such a central part of your life, would it, would it stay that way even if you stop performing? You know, often I, I've been asked if I uh, could retire from the stage and just live the music in a recording studio. But I have to say no, absolutely not. Even with the compromises that, that live you know, performance can sometimes contain. 
still at the end. I mean, that's really, it's this element of shared freedom and connection with the, with the audience that you do this for. And, you know, don't misunderstand me, I love recording and I would never, I would, actually I couldn't really function without recording either. For me it's a magical, um, there's something I feel in, in, the, in the recording studio atmosphere which when you feel connected to a world which is beyond, beyond our own and the time is totally elastic, there is no, there is no sense of time anymore. Can you describe your, your synesthesia? Is it absolute, so you'd hear a, you hear a note and you see a colour and it's always that same note and that same colour, or is it a general sort of coloration of sounds and harmonics? Every key has its, its colour and the, you know, the dominant tonality of the piece is really what's giving the piece, the color that I see. It's not systematic, it's not every time I play it, also not every time I listen to something. Mm -hmm. But when it does happen, um, that's something I've always enjoyed. It happened the first time when I was working on a Bach prelude, F sharp um, major, and I started to see this this sort of stain of, of um, undefined contours moving, moving in front of me. And I remember thinking, well, what is that now? And it became clear pretty early on that it was, you know, C is always black, B is always blue, F is always red. It's also the idea of the color. I mean, there are different dimensions to that. It's almost more about the emotional identity of the piece giving, giving you a sort of colorful environment. What colors do you see uh, when you play Liszt? Liszt is, is um, the, the major hue is in the, the sort of golden tones. Um, but again, it's, it's a B, it's a sonata in B, and that's, that's mostly the reason.